Hi, everyone. Welcome to American Literature. Um, glad we have this opportunity to get together, even though we can't be together in school. At least we have this way of communicating with one another. Uh, we're going to finish our book this year. Don't worry about that. That will happen. Um, hopefully you really enjoyed The Great Gatsby. You watched the movie and, on your own. Um, and also, hopefully you watched um, Raisin and Raisin in the Sun. Wow, forgot it for a minute. Uh, very intense movie, but really great. Um, don't forget to get your homework into me via email through the um, my works site. Okay, we're going to continue on American literature. Uh, you finished the Harlem Renaissance on your own, and we are going to work on now contemporary American literature in chapter nine. Okay, so contemporary literature uh, is period literature commonly features characters whose greatest journey is internal. It's really all about that internal journey that one makes spiritually or mentally or psychologically. The characters want to know who they really are and why they exist. They are really reflective of today's society where people just really want to know where they fit into society. They often look to the past to their ancestors, to their nation's history, even to their own childhoods, in order to discover why their lives have turned out the way they have. Uh, some contemporary writers have returned to the truth of the scripture. Uh, their characters may have the same questions, but they have the ability to find the truth because they are looking into the word. Those writers have started a subgenre in contemporary literature called Christian fiction. Now, it is a new subgenre now. But it wasn't always a subgenre. A lot of early fiction, especially, well, from the very first novels written, were considered Christian literature. Um, Daniel Defoe was a Christian. If you read Robinson Crusoe, there's a lot of Christian Christian um, influence in that. Um, Jane Austen was the daughter of a, a minister, so a lot of her her works have a Christian element. One of my all-time favorite books, The Tenet of Wildfell Hall, has an incredible Christian testimony of one of the main characters. It's just so beautifully done. So a lot of a lot of literature in the past was written by Christians and had Christian elements in them, but they were just considered fiction. They were just considered, you know, regular novels. Uh, if you read um, The Scarlet Letter, that could arguably be called a Christian novel even though the author, I'm not sure if he was a Christian or not, honestly, but he comes up with the the novel itself is so biblically intense and perfect. And the way he, he looks at the Christianity is just amazing. Then remember, we also read Uncle Tom's Cabin, where Christianity is front and center. That is a huge part of that book. So it has recently be considered been considered a subgenre as more and more people split away from Christianity and wanted to write more what we would call humanistic books. That doesn't mean they're bad. It just means that they don't have a religious focus or they don't have a godly focus. Um, so this this new subgenre called Christian fiction does focus on religious beliefs and specifically in um, biblical beliefs of God. Okay. So mainstream writers often leave their characters confused and questioning where Christian authors tend to wrap everything up, or they they at least have hope toward the end of their book. But mainstream writers will often go the other way. They will leave their characters questioning and confused because that mimics the author's own unfinished journey. Maybe they don't have hope yet. Maybe they don't really understand yet. Um, some of those books can be really fascinating to read and really great reading. Others of them will just be really annoying. Okay. I, I am not afraid to say that one of my least favorite books of all time is Catcher in the Rye. I find the main character so unlikable and so frustrating. So I, I don't recommend that book very often. Uh, people will ask me, well, is it you know is it an okay read? And I'm like, you know, I don't care for it. If you want to read it, go for it. It's not something I personally enjoy because I find him really, really annoying. And of course, at the end, there's no real wrap up to his meanderings. He's just a self-obsessed little boy. Okay. Um, let's talk about one of the most famous contemporary authors. Her name is Maya Angelou. Um, Maya Angelou, just a little bit of background, grew up in the South. Um, she was raised by a grandmother and her, uh, her mom. 
Um, but unfortunately, when my Angela was still a very young child, she was molested. And it traumatized her so much that she lost her ability to speak. So she became rather what we would call have mutism for several years. Now, during that time, she was very open about it. So, um, and, and she was very open about it everywhere that she went and, and talked about her experience and her resultant mutism. Uh, one of the things that she did, however, was she listened and she became an excellent listener. I remember when my kids were really young, I would watch Sesame Street with them all the time. That was really important time for us. It was a bonding time. They would sit in my lap and, you know, and I would clap their hands and we'd do the hand motions and everything that we're supposed to do with Sesame Street. And I remember very clearly my Angelou being on Sesame Street. And um, she didn't talk about the molestation, but she talked about the mutism. And she said, when I was a little girl, I couldn't speak. But I did like to listen. And I loved poetry and I loved things that had a rhythm to them and then she taught the kids on Sesame Street um the poem Miss Mary Mac 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 all just in black 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 and I remember listening to that and and watching her share this with these children you know I I couldn't speak but I enjoyed listening to these rhythms and these harmonies and and out of that came her love of poetry and so she she wrote several, she's written several fantastic poems, but her most famous poem is Caged Bird, which we're going to go through today. Um, as you read the, the story or the poem Caged Bird, think to yourself a little bit about what she has gone through, had gone through, and then what her people have gone through because she was African-American and many of her poems were written specifically with the voice of the African-American in thought, in her mind, okay? And that's a generalization, not a specific person. So let's read Caged Bird by Maya Angelou. The way we always do poetry is we read it one time through just to get the feel of the poem. We go back through, explain line by line, and then we read a third time where everything comes crystal clear. So let's let's do Caged Bird by Maya Angelou. The free bird leaps on the back of the wind and floats downstream till the current ends and dips his wings in the orange sun rays and dares to claim the sky. But a bird that stalks down his narrow cage can seldom see through his bars of rage. His wings are clipped His feet are tied, so he opens his throat to sing. The caged bird sings with a fearful trill of things unknown but longed for still, and his tune is heard on the distant hill, for the caged bird sings of freedom. The free bird thinks of another breeze, and the trade wind soft through the sighing trees, and the fat worms waiting on the dawn-bright lawn, and he names the sky his own. But a caged bird stands on the grave of dreams. His shadow shouts on a nightmare scream. His wings are clipped and his feet are tied, so he opens his throat to sing. The caged bird sings with a fearful trill of things unknown but long for still, and his tune is heard on the distant hill, for the caged bird sings of freedom. Okay. So we have a comparison contrast between these two birds that are going to be our main characters in this poem. We have a free bird and a caged bird. The free bird is leaping on the back of the wind, floating downstream, think of that air current carrying it down, till the air current ends and then he dips his wings and is able to rise again. And he dips his wings in the orange sun rays. So he's out there in the wind, the sun, and he dares to claim the entire sky as his own place. And then the caged bird has a very different experience. He stalks down his narrow cage. So he's stalking. That means he's walking in this very narrow cage. He's enclosed. He can seldom see through his bars of rage. 
You notice they're not the bars of the cage. They're his bars of rage. The idea is that the bird, even though he's in the cage, he is so angry at the fact that he is kept in that cage that he's not looking at the bars of the cage. He's looking through his own prison that he's created for himself of anger. Okay, so he's he can seldom see through the bars of rage. Why is he angry? Because first of all, he's in a narrow cage, but also his wings are clipped. When people keep domesticated birds, they will often clip the wings so that the wings are no longer functional for flying distances. So his wings are clipped and his feet are tied. He's tied into the cage. So what is the only way the bird can express any kind of freedom? He opens his throat and sings. It's the only freedom he has. He can let his voice soar, but he himself cannot. Let's look at what he sings. The caged bird sings with a fearful trill. There's fear there, but he's fearful of things unknown. Okay, He doesn't know what is outside of his cage. He's fearful of what's outside of his cage, and yet he still longs for what's outside of his cage. His Fearful trill is so powerful, it is so open, it is so loud that his tune is heard on the distant hill because that phrase, that that song that he sings is a song of freedom that everything and everyone desires. The free bird thinks of another breeze. That is its only thought process is, oh, I'm going to catch the other breeze. And the trade soft went the trade wind soft through the sighing trees, and the fat worms waiting on a dawn bright lawn, and he names the sky his own. So the free bird is thinking again of breezes, of the sighing trees, of the fat worms that he can eat, and the sky that he names as his own place. That is his freedom. But the caged bird stands on the grave of dreams. He will never be out there like the free bird is out. He will be enclosed in this cage for the rest of his life. He's in his own coffin. His shadow shouts on a nightmare scream. There is no out from this place. His wings are clipped. His feet are tied. So he opens his throat to sing. That's the only release it has. It is in its own coffin. It is facing down death. There is no opportunity for freedom. So the only thing it can do to express its desire for freedom is to open its throat and sing. Now, knowing what we know about Maya Angelou, and she wrote her autobiography in this book that you see on the screen in front of you. I know why the caged bird sings. This is Maya Angelou's autobiography that she wrote explaining all of this. When you think about her life, feeling trapped in an abusive situation, um, feeling like she can't really express herself, feeling like she is caged because of the molestation that she was. And yet she, as the author, could not even open her throat enough to sing. So she understands why the caged bird sings, because if she could have done it, she would have. She says, the caged bird sings with a fearful trill of things unknown, but longed for still. And his tune is heard on the distant hill, for the caged bird sings of freedom. So we don't have a speaker in this poem, but we have enough background of Maya Angelou to understand how her life helped to inform and create this poem. Now that we've gone through it line by line, let's go through it again and just read it through. Ready? Caged Bird by Maya Angelou. The free bird leaps on the back of the wind and floats downstream till the current ends and dips his wings in the orange sun rays and dares to claim the sky. But a bird that stalks down his narrow cage can seldom see through his bars of rage. His wings are clipped and his feet are tied, so he opens his throat to sing. The caged bird sings with a fearful trill of things unknown but longed for still, and his tune is heard on the distant hill, for the caged bird sings of freedom. 
The free bird thinks of another breeze, and the trade winds soft through the sighing trees, and the fat worms waiting on the dawn brought lawn, and he names the sky his own. But a caged bird stands on the grave of dreams. His shadow shouts on a nightmare scream. His wings are clipped and his feet are tied. So he opens his throat to sing. The caged bird sings with a fearful trill of things unknown but longed for still, and his tune is heard on the distant hill, for the caged bird sings of freedom. Okay, now it's your turn to take a look at your questions and your homework. Make sure you get all of those done on your own time. We are going right into the next story. This was a poem. We're going into a story, and this woman is named Alice Walker. Alice Walker has written many, many books, again, for specifically for and influenced by the African-American community and the African community as well. Um, her short story, Everyday Use, is one of my all-time favorites. And I put it in this book specifically because I love it so much and I hope that you will enjoy it too. Everyday Use by Alice Walker. Read along with me. If you don't have your book, um, right there in front of you where you can read it aloud and or read along and I hope you do if you don't please let me know so I can get you a copy of the book digitally and I will do that for you but let's go through everyday use by Alice Walker I will wait for her in the yard that Maggie and I made so clean and wavy yesterday afternoon a yard like this is more comfortable than most people know it's not just a yard it's like an extended living room When the hard clay is swept clean as a floor and the fine sand around the edges lined with tiny irregular grooves, anyone can come and sit and look up into the elm tree and wait for the breezes that never come inside the house. Maggie will be nervous until after her sister goes. She will stand hopelessly in corners, homely and ashamed of the burn scars down her arms and legs, eyeing her sister with a mixture of envy and awe. She thinks her sister has held her life always in the palm of one hand, that no is a word that the world never learned to say to her. You've no doubt seen those TV shows where the child who has made it is confronted as a surprise by her own mother and father, a tottering week, tottering week, tottering in weekly from backstage. A pleasant surprise, of course. What would they do if a parent and child came on the show only to curse out and insult each other? On TV, mother and child embrace and smile into each other's faces. Sometimes the mother and father weep. The child wraps them in her arms and leans across the table to tell how she would have not have made it without their help. I have seen these programs. Sometimes I dream a dream in which D and I are suddenly brought together on a TV program of this sort. Out of the dark and soft seated limousine, I am ushered into a bright room filled with many people. There I meet a smiling, gray, sporty man like Johnny Carson, who shakes my hand and tells me what a fine girl I have. Then we are on the stage and Dee is embracing me with tears in her eyes. She pins on my dress a large orchid, even though she has told me that once that she thinks orchids are tacky flowers. In real life, I'm a large, big-boned woman with rough, man-working hands. In the winter, I wear flannel nightgowns to bed and overalls during the day. I can kill and clean a hog as mercilessly as a man. My fat keeps me hot in zero weather. I can work outside all day, breaking ice to get water for washing. I can eat pork liver cooked over the open fire minutes after it comes steaming from the hog. One winter, I knocked a bull calf straight in the brain between the eyes with a sledgehammer and had the meat hung up to chill before nightfall. But of course, all this does not show on television. I'm the way my daughter would want me to be. A hundred pounds lighter, my skin like an uncooked barley pancake. My hair glistens in the hot bright lights. Johnny Carson has much to do to keep up with my wit and witty tongue. But that is a mistake. I know even before I wake up. Whoever knew a Johnson with a quick tongue? Who can even imagine me looking a strange white man in the eye? Seems to me I've talked to them always with one foot raised in flight with my head fumed in whichever... Sorry, should be turned. In whichever way is farthest from them. D, though, she would always look anyone in the eye. Hesitation was no part of her nature. How do I look, Mama? Maggie says, showing just enough of her thin body enveloped in pink skirt and red blouse for me to know she's there, almost hidden by the door. Come out into the yard, I say. Have you ever seen a lame animal? Perhaps a dog run over by some careless person rich enough to own a car? Sidle up to someone who is ignorant enough to be kind to him? That is the way my Maggie walks. She's been like this, chin on chest, eyes on the ground, feet in shuffle, ever since the fire that burned the other house to the ground. 
Dee is lighter than Maggie, with nice hair and fuller figure. She's a woman now, though sometimes I forget. How long ago was it that the other house burned? Ten? Twelve years? Sometimes I can still hear the flames and feel Maggie's arms sticking to me, her hair smoking and her just falling off her in little black peppery flakes. Her eyes seemed stretched open, blazed open by the flames, reflected in them. And Dee. I see her standing off under the sweet gum tree she used to dig gum out of. A look of concentration on her face as she watched the last dingy gray board of the house fall in toward the red-hot brick chimney. Why don't you do a dance around the ashes, I wanted to ask her. She had hated the house that much. I used to think she hated Maggie, too, but that was before we raised money, the church and me, and sent her to Augusta to school. She used to read us without pity, forcing words, lies, other folks' habits, whole lives upon us, too, sitting trapped and ignorant underneath her voice. She washed us in a river of make-believe, burned us with a lot of knowledge we didn't necessarily need to know, pressed us to her with the serious way she read, to shove us away just at the moment like dimwits we seemed about to understand. D wanted nice things. A yellow organdy dress to wear to her graduation from high school, black pumps to match a green suit she'd med- made from an old suit somebody gave me. She was determined to stare down any disaster in her efforts. Her eyelids would not flicker for a minute at a time. Often I fought of the temptation to shake her. At 16, she had a style of her own and knew what style was. I never had an education myself. After second grade, the school was closed down. Don't ask me why. In 1927, colored asked fewer questions than they do now. Sometimes Maggie reads to me. She stumbles along good-naturedly but can't see well. She knows she's not bright. Like good looks and money, quickness passed her by. <laughs> She will marry John Thomas, who has mossy teeth and an earnest face. And then I'll be free to sit here and, I guess, just sing church songs to myself, although I never was a good singer. Never could carry a tune. I was always better at man's jobs. I used to love to milk till I was hooked in the side in 49. Cows are soothing and slow and don't bother you unless you try to milk them the wrong way. I have deliberately turned my back on the house. It is three rooms, just like the one that burned, except the roof is tin. They don't make shingle roofs anymore. There are no real windows, just some holes cut in the sides, like portholes in a ship, but not round and not square, with rawhide holding the shutters up on the outside. This house is in a pasture, too, like the other one. No doubt when Dee sees it, she'll want to tear it down. She wrote me once that no matter where we choose to live, she will manage to come to see us, but she will never bring her friends. Maggie and I thought about this, and Maggie asked me, Mama, when did Dee ever have any friends? She had a few. Furtive boys in pink shirts hanging about on wash day after school. Nervous girls who never laughed, impressed with her. They worshipped the well-turned phrase, the cute shape, the scalding humor that erupted like bubbles and lie. She read to them. When she was courting Jimmy T, she didn't have much time to pay to us, but turned all her fault-finding power on him. He flew to marry a cheap girl, city girl from a family of ignorant, flashy people. She hardly had time to recompose herself. When she comes, I will meet... <gasps> But there they are. Okay, we got a lot of background already in this story, and it's an amazing story. We have Mama here waiting for the arrival of her daughter, Maggie. I'm sorry, her daughter, Dee, to come home. But Dee has always made it very clear that she has always hated her home. She doesn't like the fact that they were poor. She doesn't like the fact that they lived in kind of a shack of a house. Uh, she didn't, the mom thinks that she didn't even like her sister, Maggie. Um Dee's has always been about improving, not just herself, but she wanted to improve everyone around her. And now she's finally, finally coming back home after a very long time away. Maggie is not looking forward to her sister's arrival. According to Mama, Maggie's going to be shy. She's going to be standoffish because she doesn't really feel comfortable around Dee. And she probably has good reason to. Dee is a very sharp, very... Um, in your face kind of person. You saw that when she she doesn't drop her eyes. She always looked people right in the face. It's really hard for me to do. Um, but Maggie is just not she's feeling anxious about the fact that her daughter her her sister is coming. Mama is just looking forward to seeing her daughter again, but she's not really expecting to be treated with much respect at all by her oldest daughter who is who is deigned to come home. So here we are. D is just pulling up to the house. Maggie attempts to make a dash for the house in her shuffling way, but I stay her with my hand. Come back here, I say. And she stops and tries to dig a well in the sand with her toe. 
It's hard to see them clearly through the strong sun, but even the first glimpse of leg out of the car tells me it is D. Her feet were always neat looking, as if God himself had shaped them with a certain style. From the other side of the car comes a short, stocky man. Hair is all over his head a foot long and hanging from his chin like a kinky mule tail. I hear Maggie suck in her breath, <gasps> is what it sounds like. Like when you see a wriggling end of a snake just in front of your foot on the road. <gasps> D next. A dress down to the ground in this hot weather. A dress so loud it hurts my eyes. There are yellows and oranges enough to throw back the light of the sun. I feel my whole face warming from the heat waves it throws out. Earrings gold, too, and hanging down to her shoulders, bracelets dangling and making noise when she moves her arm up to shake the folds of the dress out of her armpits. The dress is loose and flows, and as she walks closer, I like it. I hear Maggie go, <gasps> again. It's her sister's hair. It stands straight up like the wool of a sheep. It is black as night, and around the edges are two long pigtails that rope about like small lizards disappearing behind her ears. Wazuzo Tino, she says, coming in in that gliding way the dress makes her move. The short, stocky fellow with the hair to his navel is all grinning, and he follows up with, Asalam Akim, my mother and my sister. He moves to hug Maggie, but she falls back right up against the back of my chair. I feel her trembling there when I look up to see the perspiration falling off her chin. Talk about nervous when you get sweat coming off your chin. Don't get up, says Dee. Since I'm stout, it takes a something of a push. You can see me trying to move a second or two before I make it. She turns, showing white heels through her sandals, and goes back to her car. Out she peeps next with a Polaroid. She stoops down quickly and lines up picture after picture of me sitting there in front of the house with Maggie cowering behind me. She never takes a shot without making sure the house is included. When a cow comes nibbling around the edge of the yard, she snaps it and me and Maggie and the house. Then she puts a Polaroid in the back seat of the car and comes up and kisses me on the forehead. Meanwhile, Asalam Akim is going through the motions with Maggie's hand. Maggie's hand is as limp as a fish and probably as cold despite the sweat, and she keeps trying to pull it back. It looks like Asalam Akim wants to shake hands, but he wants to do it fancy, or maybe he doesn't know how to shake hands, how people shake hands. Anyhow, he soon gives up on Maggie. Well, I say, D. No, mama, she says, not D. Wengaro lequana kemanjo. What happened to D? I wanted to know. She's dead, Wengaro said. I couldn't bear it any longer, being named after the people who oppressed me. Okay, let's explain this a little bit here. There was a time in American history, in the 50s and 60s specifically, where many people who had relatives who were slaves no longer wanted to keep the last names that the relatives had because they considered it the slave owner's name um, this is what d is doing she's changed her name because she doesn't want to have a name of a person who owned slaves she doesn't want to get take that last name but she is calling herself wangaro and um, she's saying i can't i can't be named d because that was the name of a person who oppressed me and then mom sets her straight with a little history lesson. You know as well as me, you was named after your Aunt DC. I said, DC is my sister. She had been named D. We called her Big D after D was born. But who was she named after? asked Wangaro. I guess after Grandma D, I said. And who was she named after? asked Wangaro. Her mother, I said, and then saw Wangaro was getting tired. That's about as far back as I can trace it, I said. Though, in fact, I probably could have carried it back beyond the Civil War through the branches. Well said Asalam Akim. There you are. <gasps> I heard Maggie say. There I was not, I said, before DC cropped up in our family, so why should I try to trace it that far back? He just stood there grinning, looking down at me like somebody inspecting a Model A car. Every once in a while, he and Wingaro sent eye signals over my head. How do you pronounce this name? I asked. You don't have to call me by it if you don't want to, said Wingaro. Why shouldn't I ask? If that's what you want us to call you, we'll call you. I know it might sound awkward at first, said Wingaro. I'll get used to it, she said. Ream it out again. Well, soon we got the name out of the way. I saw McKim had a name twice as long and three times as hard. After I tripped over it two or three times, he told me to just call him Hakima Barber. I wanted to ask him, was he a barber? But I didn't really think he was, so I didn't ask. You must belong to those beef cattle peoples down the road, I said. They say 
Assalamakim when they meet you too, but they didn't shake hands, always too busy, feeding the cattle, fixing the fences, putting up salt lick shelters, throwing down hay. When the white folks poisoned some of their herd, the men stayed up all night with rifles in their hands. I walked a mile and a half just to see the sight. Hakima Barber said, I accept some of their doctrines, but farming and raising cattle is not my style. They didn't tell me, and I didn't ask whether Wangaro, D, had really gone and married him. Sorry. We sat down to eat, and right away he said he didn't eat collards, and pork was unclean. Wangaro, though, went on through the chitlins and cornbread and greens and everything else. She talked a blue streak over the sweet potatoes. Everything delighted her, even the fact that we still used the benches her daddy made for the table when we couldn't afford to buy chairs. Oh, mama, she cried. Then she turned to Hakim, a barber. I never knew how lovely these benches are. You can feel the rump prints, she said, running her hands underneath her and along the bench. Then she gave a sigh, and her hand closed over Grandma D's butter dish. <gasps> That's it, she said. I knew there was something I wanted to ask you if I could have. She jumped up from the table and went over in the corner where the churn stood. The milk in it clabber by now. That's when milk is old and it starts getting chunky. She looked at the churn, she looked at the churn and looked at it. This churn top is what I need, she said. Didn't Uncle Buddy whittle it out of a tree y'all used to have? Yes, I said. Uh-huh, she said happily. And I want the dasher, too. Uncle Buddy whittled that, too, asked the barber. D, Wingaro, looked up at me. Aunt D's first husband whittled the dash, said Maggie, so low you almost couldn't hear her. His name was Henry, but they called him Stash. Maggie's brain is like an elephant's, Wingaro said, laughing. I could use the chute top as a centerpiece for the alcove table, she said, sliding a plate over the chute. And I think of something artistic to do with the dasher. When she finished wrapping the dasher, the handle stuck out. I took it for a moment in my hands. You didn't even have to look close to see where the hands pushing the dasher up and down to make the butter had left a kind of sink in the wood. In fact, there were a lot of small sinks. You could see where thumbs and fingers had sunk into the wood. It was beautiful light yellow wood from a tree that grew in the yard where Big D and Stash had lived. So Mama is looking at this dasher that she's still using, and she's still using the top of the dasher as well. Um, she's looking at this. D is collecting this and saying, this is part of family history. I want to take this. I want to protect its family history. But it's living history. Her mom and sister are still using these materials. They're still using the benches. They're still using everything that the family had made to live with. But Dee is looking at this as something that is in the past. After dinner, Dee, Wangaro, went to the trunk at the foot of my bed and started rifling through it. Maggie hung back in the kitchen over the dishpan. Out came Wangaro with two quilts. They had been pieced by Grandma Dee and then Big Dee, and me had hung them on the quilt frames on the front porch and quilted them. One was in the Lone Star pattern. The other was Walk Around the Mountain. In both of them were scraps of dresses Grandma D had worn 50 or more years ago, bits and pieces of Grandpa Gerald's paisley shirts, and one teeny faded blue piece about the size of a penny matchbox that was from the great Grandpa Ezra's uniform that he wore in the Civil War. This quilt or these quilts have pieces of the family's history sewn together in them and they were created by women in the family who remembered the history these are their history books in fabric form mama Wangara said sweet as a bird can i have these old quilts i heard something fall in the kitchen and a minute later the kitchen door slammed why don't you take one of the two of the others i asked these old things were just done by me and Big D from some tops your grandma pieced before she died. With the way a quilt is made, the top is is pieced together and sewn together. Um, the the pieces, actual pieces, are sewn together, and then there's a, a batting, a center section, and then there's a bottom part, and then all together those are sewn together um, by hand. Okay, so that's what makes it a quilt. It's actually three layers. No, said Wingaro, I don't want those. They were stitched around the borders by machine. That'll make them last better, I said. That's not the point, said Wingaro. These are all pieces of dresses Grandma used to wear. She did all the stitching by hand. Imagine. She doesn't have to imagine. Mama was there when it happened. She held the quilts securely in her arms, stroking them. Some of the pieces, like the lavender ones, come from old clothes her mother handed down to her, I said, moving up to touch the quilts. D, Wingaro moved back just enough so I couldn't reach the quilts. They already belonged to her. She's taking the history out of her mother's hands and claiming it for herself. 
Imagine, she breathed again, clutching them closely to her bosom. The truth is, I said, I promise to give them quilts to Maggie for when she marries John Thomas. She gasped like a bee had stung her. Maggie can't appreciate these quilts, she said. She'd probably be backward enough to put them to everyday use. Okay, here's a moment for book nerds everywhere. When the title is used in the story, we all have a little <gasps> yay moment. The story is called Everyday Use. Mama and Dee are living their history with items that they use every day. It doesn't mean they ignored their history at all. It means that they embraced it and are living with it on the daily. Dee, on the other hand, has completely left the family and has come back looking at this history as something that is almost academic. She wants to claim it for herself now that she's away. She wants to look at this as history that she can leave. It's, it's been in the past. Now she wants to remove it from the past and claim it as her own history. I reckon she would, I said. God knows I've been saving them long enough with nobody using them. I hope she will. Mama's like, I hope that she does use them every single day. I didn't want to bring up how I had offered Dee Wangara a quilt when she had went away to college. Then she had told me they were old-fashioned, out of style. But they're priceless, she was saying now furiously, for she has a temper. Maggie would put them on the bed and in five years they'd be in rags less than that. She can always make some more, I said. Maggie knows how to quilt. The implication there is that Dee doesn't. Dee Wangara looked at me with hatred. You just will not understand. The point is these quilts. These quilts. Well, I said, stumped, what would you do with them? Hang them, she said, as if that was the only thing you could do with quilts. Maggie by now was standing in the door, and I could almost hear the sound her feet made as they scraped over each other. She can have them, Mama, she said, like somebody used to never winning anything or having anything reserved for her. I can remember Grandma D without the quilts. I looked at her hard. She had filled her bottom lip with checkerberry snuff, that's tobacco that's flavored with a berry leaf. And it gave her face a kind of dopey hangdog look. It was Grandma D and Big D who taught her how to quilt herself. She stood there with her scarred hands hidden in the fold of her skirt. She looked at her sister with something like fear, but it wasn't mad at her. This was Maggie's portion. This was the way she knew God to work. When Mama looks at, at Maggie, she sees the history in Maggie, the family's history. You see, it was Grandma D and Big D that taught Maggie the skills to quilt. Maggie remembers all the parts of family history. She lives that history. She has the scars on her body to remember when their house burned down. She is an embodiment of the family's history. And this look at her younger daughter and this shame on her face that nothing is ever going to work out for her and she's willing to accept that for herself, it's going to make Mama snap just a bit. When I looked at her like that, something hit me in the top of my head and ran down to the soles of my feet, just like when I'm in church and the Spirit of God touches me and I get happy and shout, I did something I never done before. I hugged Maggie to me then dragged her on into the room, snatched the quilts out of Miss Wangaroo's hands, and dumped them into Maggie's lap. Maggie just sat there on my bed with her mouth open. Take one or two of the others, I said to Dee. But she turned without a word and went out to Hakima Barber. You just don't understand, she said, as Maggie and I came out to the car. What don't I understand, I wanted to know. Your heritage, she said, and then she turned to Maggie, kissed her, and said, you ought to try to make something of yourself too, Maggie. It really is a new day for us, but from the way you and Mama still live, you'd never know it. She put on some sunglasses that hid everything above the tip of her nose and chin. Maggie smiled, maybe the sunglasses, but a real smile, not scared. After we watched the car dust settle, I asked Maggie to bring me a dip of snuff, and we then the two of us sat there just enjoying until it was time to go in the house and go to bed. According to Dee, Mama doesn't understand her heritage, but obviously Mama and Maggie understand their heritage much better than Dee does, which gives us that little bit of irony at the end here. Now, I hope you enjoyed the story. It is one of my all-time favorites. 
And I love Alice Walker's writing. She's fantastic. But I want you to take some time before you do the homework, maybe just kind of give it another read through and answer all those questions. Really think through those answers before you write them down and before you fill in the bubble. And I will get back to you tomorrow. Well, actually, yeah, tomorrow. Um, thank you very much for um, being here for this YouTube presentation. And I'm looking forward to continuing on with you.